Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Come in, come in, come in. This is Tamika Zen. I am Tamika. Get on in here, y'all. Get on in here, okay? Kick off your shoes and relax your feet. You are now in the Zen. So, guys, this is my review recap for Atlanta, y'all. The name of this episode is The Goof That Sat By The Door, Season 4, Episode 8. And the synopsis tells us that we are getting an in-depth look at the making of an American classic, a goofy movie. Now, child, let's pause there, okay? (laughs) Let's get into this because if you were like me and you were at home and you were saying, what is this? Is this a commercial? Is this a documentary? Did they say Atlanta wasn't coming on this week? Did they say it was coming on late? If you was checking your God, if you was checking the Zagon channel to make sure you had it on the right channel, then you were like me because I was doing the same thing. I didn't know what was happening at first, okay? But we did see the Atlanta logo, you know, come up and we see that they are telling us that at the request of band lawyers and band stands for, you know, Black American Network, they acknowledge that this story they are about to tell us, okay, has been fact checked to the best of their ability, y'all. And they are going to, you know, tell us about this story that may have certain details that are presented that may not be endorsed by the Walt Disney Company. So between that and the synopsis, we know this got to do with Disney and this got to do with the Goofy movie. And I thought it was funny because, of course, Disney owns, you know, FX. But the first thing that came to my mind was seeing the goof who sat by the door. Immediately, I thought about the book, The Spoof That Sat By The Door. Okay, if you have never, ever heard of this book, you know, get into it. Check it out. Check it out. Check it out. This is a book written by Sam Green. Lee is a book that we've seen um, Franklin's father reading in. You know, um, Snowfall, if you watch that, and it is a book that was also turned into a movie. And it talks about a former CIA agent, Lawrence Cook, who, you know, once he leaves the CIA, he basically organizes these black teenagers, okay, makes them well, you know, trained guerrilla bands and have them, you know, go on this mission where they are hell bent on overthrowing the white establishment. So again, if you never read that book, you know, check it out. But that came to my mind with just seeing this title. Now, as far as Goofy goes, Goofy is one of my favorite characters and I love a Goofy movie. And when they say that Goofy is an American classic, I concur. Okay, I definitely had my son watching this when he was small and I still got it in here now. Okay, do not judge me because that's what we do with classics. We keep them. All right. Y'all put it in the comments and let me know if y'all are down with Goofy. Okay. We also, at the beginning of this episode, have Gemma talking, right? Because this is a mockumentary, right? It's a documentary style that they are using to storytell. And again, they did an excellent job because they looked real. If you know what documentaries looked like back in the days, listen, this was accurate to the T. And so we start out with her telling us about this man, you know, Thomas Washington. This is his story. This is the spooked you know, the goof that sat by the door, okay, a story of Thomas Washington. And she started out by letting us know that this is the 1990s and we had a lot of stuff going on in the 1990s, right? And we also had Disney, you know, on the edge, right, of um, bankruptcy, y'all. So Little Mermaid kind of came in and saved the day. You know, we got um, Beauty and the Beast getting nominated and we got Lion King breaking all kind of records. Now, again, Little Mermaid, another one of my faves. Right. And we know all the controversy that has been going around these last couple of months where people heads about to explode because we was getting a black Little Mermaid and they didn't know what to do with themselves. Right. And not only just with the Little Mermaid, not only just with Disney, but in life in general and throughout Hollywood. A lot of shows and a lot of movies has got people brain vessels about to pop, right? They was mad at House of the Dragons having a black person up there. They was mad about Star Wars having black people up there. Been mad about how, you know, Power of the Rings having black people up there. So this is definitely a conversation that we have been having. And this, among other things, was basically addressed in this episode. So it's very relevant to the things that we are talking about, whether it's amongst family and friends, social media, and things of that nature. Now, moving on along, of course, when we talk about 
The Lion King, yes, that absolutely broke records at the box office, okay? We got all kind of spinoffs from it. We got three movies out of it. We got a live action movie out of it with Beyonce doing the soundtrack. We got them on Broadway. And baby, that Broadway show, honey, they be singing their behinds off. I ain't never seen a show like that one. And so definitely Lion King changed the game. But we also see that this is the same time that we have four officers, four LAP or LAPD officers that get acquitted for acquitted for the Rodney King beating. And this, of course, makes L.A. go crazy. All right. It is an outrage. You know, it's chaos. We got, um, you know, stuff burning. People are angry. There's fire, there's chaos, there's basically, you know, massive citywide destruction. And of course, this really did happen. This is a pivotal moment in black culture in the 90s. And for any reason whatsoever, you do not know about Rodney King or the things that went down in L.A. at that time. Please educate yourself on that as well, because that was a fact that did happen. Now, on the flip side, she's telling us that as this is happening, we also have a cultural moment that we don't know about. OK, we didn't hear about this one. We didn't know about this one. Nobody was telling us about it. And if she wasn't here telling us about it now, apparently we still wouldn't know. And that is basically, you know, Disney at their most powerful time and moment on this faithful day bring in you know one of their first black movie and tv you know ceos to get in charge in hollywood and this is a black unassuming animator who comes from east atlanta and he winds up at the disney headquarters and we trying to figure out you know how did he get there we are hearing his story and how this led up to him becoming a ceo at disney okay and so Basically, this is, you know, the goof that sat by the door, the Thomas Washington story. So let's go ahead and get into it. Now, as we are finding out about him, of course, we are going to talk to family. We are going to talk to friends. We are going to talk to co-workers just like they would do if this was a real documentary. And so we started out talking to his mother, okay, who is Evelyn Washington, and she's letting us know, well, first and foremost, Tom was named after Tom Jones, okay? You know, it was kind of a thing where most times you would name your son after their father, they would become a junior, but because her husband played Tom Jones so much when he courted her, they decided to name him Tom. They was like, they knew he was different. They knew he was going to do different things. They knew he was special. He was going places, you know, and we also found out that Tom has basically been drawing since he came out the daggone wound, okay? He was always drawing all over everything he drew on, you know, um, notebooks, textbook, desk, the teachers, it was driving them crazy. They was like, oh boy, this boy loved cartoons. Okay. One of the first ones that he actually loved was Astro Boy. I can remember my brothers used to watch that. He would even draw on the walls. Okay, Thomas, you would have had to clean them damn walls. But anyway, you know, he, you get the point. He loved to draw. And so one day he was asking his cousin, like, you know, can Astro Boy come here and save them? And his cousin is like, from what? Like, why does he need to save us? And he told him, I don't know, just kind of shrugged his shoulders, right? And was like, from everything, from anything, right? And so he thought it was really interesting that here he is only eight years old and he's over here having something like that on his mind, you know? He immediately knew from a young age that things was harder for them and that life was unfair they would look at tv and see that you know you had these white people living in these fancy houses beautiful houses with picket fence and most times you were seeing the black people committing crimes getting arrested doing the stealing and things of that nature right there was nobody of a positive nature that they could actually look to everything was showing them black people being bad and so they were able to understand that concept at a really young age. But nonetheless, you know, moving on from there, they even talked about him being bullied, you know, him being picked on, even down to his drawings. Sometimes they would rip the pages out of his book and he would say, you know, why is me drawing making people mad? Why is that? Why they messing with me for that? You know, he was always trying to fit in. His cousin was basically saying that, 
you know, he wasn't built for that. He wasn't no fighter, none of that stuff, right? And he didn't understand why it wasn't cool for him to be drawing. And his mother basically told him, listen, it's going to be a time when none of that is going to matter and none of that is going to make a difference. Don't even worry about it, okay? One day ain't none of that going to matter. And you know mama, you know, knows best. So, you know, listen to mama. So, nonetheless, you know, he basically, you know, goes on through his schooling, gets in, you know, through high school or whatever, and gets into college, right? He gets into SCAD, which stood for um, Savannah. I think it was Savannah, if I'm not mistaken, um, academic, you know, um, school or whatever, right? Um, no, I'm sorry. Savannah School of Arts and Design. That's what it was. And as he gets in there, you know, he meets this professor that's looking at his work because when he put in the application, he basically had put like, I'm going to work at Disney one day. And as far as him saying that, they just laugh because they say everybody says that, right? That's everybody's dream. So that wasn't really nothing that stood out to them. But he sent this little booklet in with it. And, you know, the professor was just saying that automatically from this little book you could see that he definitely had the potential to one day become somebody that did have the wit to be able to become an animator with Disney it was not as far-fetched as somebody would have thought just by looking at the application you may have felt that way but once you seen his sketches you knew that he had talent there and so he had um Art Babbitt come and give a speech at the school and this changed his life. He immediately kind of levitated and attached himself and wanted to kind of use Art Babbitt as the blueprint for what he wanted to become. And if you don't know, Art Babbitt is a real person. He really was um, an animation director with Disney. He won over 80 awards and he basically was the one that developed Goofy, who would then become, you know, Thomas's favorite character the character that he wanted to work on the character that he wanted to make a movie about the character that he felt most linked to that he felt was kind of a representation of a black man you know his cousin made the comment he remembers them having a conversation and Thomas saying to him we all can agree right that Goofy is a ninja <laughs> let's not get it twisted Goofy is definitely black and so he definitely felt that connection with him but he gravitated to um you know Mr. Um Art and he really got obsessed with him from what they were saying. And then he wanted to do an, an, an analysis on Goof, right? That was the next thing he did. You know, he wanted to research. He wanted to find out as much stuff as he could on the character Goofy and what made Art make him the way that he was. You know, he felt like he was half witty. He seemed a little slow. He seemed shiftless. You know, some people thought that he was dumb and all of that different kind of stuff, right? And so he just really wanted to get in depth into what um, Goofy was all about. And then he went on to, you know, research all of the previous cartoons that Art had did of Goofy and wanting to make his own, you know, and take Goofy into a completely different, um, you know, dynamic than what Art had been doing. And so then he did this centerpiece that was called Goofy, Please. And so the professor saying that when he was looking at these, he was like, wow, you know, he showed me some of these pieces and he was thinking to himself, he looked at the pieces and he looked at him and he thought, you know, damn, this kid is from another universe. This kid is out of this world, right? But there was no denying that he had the talent there and that he could become whatever he wanted to become. You know, the cousin even talked about, you know, that he used to laugh at him. He never really took him serious. He would just laugh and he just thought that it was funny. But, you know, clearly he did have talent. It wasn't like he was just pulling it out of his daggone, you know, behind. And when he did his thesis, which was this incredible short film, according to his professor, this thesis was called... um a little prince i believe it was right and it was none other than of course the singer prince and this was done in 1990 right where he just was like on this rocket ship that went up in the air and he was screaming and you know all the teachers or whatever felt that it was very deep and he said depending on who you were and where you watched it you definitely connected it to him because this was a piece that he did after his father died and his cousin talks about how hard he took this death and he thought that he wouldn't be able to move on 
from it. You know, it had devastated him so much and he was so different and his brain had exploded or whatever the case may be. Right. So the professor was saying, depending on who you were and when you saw it, depending on how you took it, it could either be the funniest thing you ever seen or the saddest thing you ever seen. But this was what gave him the shot to get into Disney. Once they saw this, it was no question that he had what it takes. Right. And so he did have the opportunity and he did get, you know, called into Disney right out of coming from school. Right. And he was at the company. He's doing well. Things is going along. This is right off of them having their, you know, Little Mermaid, get them back going where they want to go. And they had just added in this diversity program and they figured they wanted younger voices. They wanted somebody that could represent them. They wanted a diversified point of view, you know, and someone that could actually strengthen the company. And Thomas just so happened to be one of the first ones to come in that they thought could do this. He came in as an assistant animator. The first project he ever worked on was DuckTales, the movie, you know, Treasure of the Lost Lamb. And, you know, he was happy and everything. Things was going fine. <coughs> Excuse me. But he kind of wanted it to be going faster. And in the middle of all of this, the uprisings happened. So now when this is happening, of course, he's getting upset and he's calling his mother like, I want to get out there and ride too. He's getting pissed off. And his mother is nervous and, you know, worried about him, of course, because he's working in L.A. And she's telling him, like, no, you don't need to get out there in the streets. What you need to do is riot with your pen and paper, okay? She ain't want him going out there in the streets. And so she was like, you know, use that to tell your story and tell what you want to be done and what you feel that we could do and all that other kind of stuff and put your message out that way as opposed to him actually physically being out there in the streets, right? And so, you know... As we move from there, we basically had like one guy that had to step down and he had put this guy Dennis in his place. And Dennis was not even in the position, not even two weeks before he ended up getting sick and having to go out. And he ended up passing away, which nobody, of course, was not expecting. And so when he passed away, his position opened up. And we had, you know, of course, people apply and Thomas was one of them. And they basically picked Thomas, okay, by default because you had Thomas Washington and then you had Thompson, okay. And they went with Thomas thinking he was Thompson. And then when he get there, it's like, oops, wait a minute. Nope, we made a mistake. Okay, that's not Thompson. That's Thomas. And he is a black man, not a white man. Okay, so they was a little upset about this. But at this point, it's too late. Thomas is there. Y'all cannot renege and take the, you know, the position back. So y'all got to go ahead and let him work and let him come in to do what he got to do. So they pretty much just had a handshake. And said, okay, we're going to give him a chance. We're going to bring him in. We're going to see what he got. You know, um, we can't get rid of him now and be like, oh, no, we got to let you go because you're not white, you black. So now you have this new black young animator that is in the CEO position that is coming in and changing things in a way that they weren't expecting. You know, he hit in the ground running immediately and pointing out different stuff to them. Like one of the first meetings that he called, he showed them this clip where Mickey is pulling Pluto by a leash. And he's like, um, why is Goofy not saying nothing? And they like, what do you mean? Why Goofy not saying nothing? They like Goofy is a dog. You know, he says Goofy is a dog. Um, Pluto is a dog. Why he not standing up for him? So he already like straight out the gate is questioning things, bringing things to their attention. You know, all of a sudden he is really trying to tell them which direction that the company needs to go in and how they are not representing black people in the way that he thinks that they should be representing. You know, he's trying to prove himself. He's not with the foolishness, you know, and when he first tells his cousin that he's a CEO, he's laughing like, yeah, okay, whatever. But then he goes to the office and sees the office and sees people coming and greeting him. And he like, wait, wait a minute. They really did. You know what I'm saying? Give him this job. And he really is the CEO. Like what the heck is going on here? Oh shoot. My cousin is the CEO of Disney so you know at this point we also meet this other man that is also a black man that's been working there for years he says that his title was pretty much an in-between guy and he had been working as an in-between guy for years and years and years he know he never moved and what an in-between guy does is that let's say if it's going to be a slap scene you know you would have that um 
higher up animator that would do the first and the last sequence of it and the in-between guy would just put all the scenes that's going to be in between that and he said all of a sudden Thomas came in and was like you're going to be the lead director and he was like oh what and he said yeah this is going to be the blackest movie of all time I want you in charge I want you to be leading things you know and we kind of get like a montage of different black films and stuff that was happening during that time with you know um <laughs> so public enemy playing in the background and he says that he wants to talk about segregation he wants to talk about single parenting you know he wants to talk about low income trajectories he want to talk about gang violence incarceration he want to talk about the diets that African Americans is having he want to just cover it all he want to make a movie that covers this and more and the character that he feels like that he can use to display this that would be a perfect character is goofy okay hence a goofy movie he gonna to use this to let people know you know everything that's going on and he said a lot of people think goofy is dumb but i want to show that goofy is dealing with you know a shitty job an angry kid he's dealing with being embarrassed and his lack of influence and i want to show all those different aspects and so he said he thought this was wild coming from him because he was like as far as i know you know what i'm saying he grew up pretty good he had a pretty solid home life so he was kind of shocked that he wanted to show this side of goofy and bring it in the way that he was saying that he wanted to bring it in child okay and so you know pretty much from there this is where we going with the goofy movie right and also you know his son well i'm kind of jumping because he gets married quick okay he gets married to his wife and they have their son quick and their son name is max and of course his son name is maxwell i should say right and of course goofy's son is max and so this was literally like his love letter to his son right he's saying this is for you you know and he's naming this character supposedly after his son right and he was even tell his wife like if for any reason i don't make it and i'm not around by the time this movie comes out you make sure that he you know he sees this and she was like that made her real nervous like what the heck are you talking about right and she said they lived a pretty simple life they never really needed nothing extravagant you know sometimes she may wake up and it may be a coffee maker or a refrigerator and she said that was their life and that was thomas and other than that he really was just very dedicated to you know this movie but he also was a person that was dedicated to his son had a great relationship with his son used to take trips with his son you know really put his all into his son and their relationship and really loved him a lot and so he wanted um the goofy and max character to just basically show that because him and his son was inseparable and he did everything for him right and so she basically would just be, be you know he just basically kept saying like this is for him like this goofy movie is for him right and so that's how determined he was you know about it and um he moved on you know and continued with this and you know they was just saying like at this time, there was so many different types of stuff that was on TV. We had Blaine and Antoinette from In Living Color, right? And then the flip side of that would be like New Jack City with, you know, Wesley Snipes and My My Brother's Keeper. And so he was trying to go in a completely different direction than both of those he just wanted to show a family man he wanted to show a father you know being with his son and taking trips with him and stuff like that and you know kind of show that that stereotype that dads is not there right um it would be different it was a contrast that was showing a nuanced portrayal of a black man a man that put his family as a priority and that you know wanted to show their kids that they loved them no matter what and accepted them no matter what and would be there for them no matter what even though in society and in the real world you know that's a lot of pain that we dealing with and they're probably not going to do that for you the way that i do and that's facts on facts on facts okay that was basically what he wanted to depict and so maxwell his son was saying you know a lot of things that his dad laid in the movie at the time he couldn't see it then but he sees it more now he could see his vision he could see where he was going with it he said you know it was a part in the movie where max is singing this song and he's flying 
above the crowd and he dunks the basketball and he's getting cheered by all his peers or whatever. And he could see that his father was trying to show the exceptionalism in blacks, you know, and how some people believe that, you know, the performing of assimilation is the best way to get by. But he was like his dad wanted it to be known and to prove that limitations were just that they were limits that were set by others, outsiders, not us. Right. And he said that's why he also put the fishing trip in because him and his dad will always go on fishing trips and he wanted fishing to be in the movie. And so I thought that was interesting. I was just wondering, like, side note, if Donald Glover ever did fishing trips with his dad because we got him doing fishing trips with Lottie in the last episode. And then we're seeing fishing being mentioned in this episode. You know, I, for one, went on one fishing trip with my dad, okay, and I went on one with my better half. You know, God bless the dead. Um, he used to always, that was something that him and his family did, right? I went camping once. I sent my son camping as a kid. And so even though these are not things that people probably look at and be like, you know, black people don't do that, right? That's not what's supposed to be considered to be our norm. It is some of us that do it, that may do it once in a while or may have only did it once or whatever. But that just popped in my mind. Like, is this something that... You know, Donald Glover has some type of relationship with somebody in his family that maybe they did that. But as we go on, we also hear, you know, Mr. In Between is telling us how this was also supposed to show the Green Book. It was supposed to show how we had to travel during, you know, the rural South and Jim Crow in, in the 30s and 40s. And if you don't know about the Green Book, please do educate yourself on that. That is also something true, something real that we did have to do. He wanted to represent, you know, in the mind of the brute of the viewer, how black travelers went. You know, they did show a piece of that inside of um, Lovecraft um, Country. And they also show that, of course, in the movie, The Green Book, but I would not just, you know, look at The Green Book as a representation of it, child. Okay, I would dig a little deeper than that, but that was something real. So that was interesting to me that they were saying that was something that he wanted to show as well. This had a lot more deeper meanings in Thomas' eyes than people probably would have realized. And he was trying to bring all of this to the forefront. He wanted people to see black dads in America. And he wanted this, you know, road trip to be a part of the movement, okay? And so even though kids may not have fully understood and knew the stakes, it was basically like, this is our destiny and this is how our children can get a future, you know, and draw uh, on their own path on their own terms in a way that had never been seen before. And you would see these little clips of him in these meetings where he was literally telling the class, like, you know, you got to be able to draw these characters and have these characters talk the way that a person, black person actually talks, the way that they actually walk, the way that they move. You know, you got to have authentic black characters. If it's not going to be authentic, then we don't want it. He was actually to the point where he wanted to give out assignments where he's like, hang out with some black people, go to some black cookouts, learn how they see, you know, things, learn what they do and become more aware, become more knowledgeable so that you will know how to draw it the right way. So they said, you know, they was trying to tell him like pull back at this point. He was kind of scaring these white people. OK, because they said they was getting complaints and they said it was nothing subtle about him. He was direct and to the point he knew what he wanted, how he wanted it, when he wanted it. And that was it. He didn't even want Mickey in the movie. He said, nah, Mickey, white. I don't need him. They was like, what are you talking about? Mickey is Disney. How are you going to have a movie, you know, about him? He like, nah, this ain't about Mickey. This about Goofy. OK. He was like, <laughs> I ain't trying to mess with, you know, Mickey right now. And, you know, the guy, Mr. In Between, said this. He told me from the beginning that, you know, he was trying to do what he wanted to do. He said a lot of us knew that he was probably going to get fired soon and we would make fun of him. It was like a game. Now, at the same time, he's working 15, 16, 18 hour days, putting all his time into this or whatever. Right. And he would yell at them like, we don't dance like that. This is the way we dance and give them demonstrations and want them to dance that way. He was like, this is the way you got to, you know, draw the character with him dancing like this. And he literally would get up in front of the class and, you know, demonstrate or if they was dapping each other, you know, no, that's not the way we dap. That's not a dap. That's not a dap. Let me show you, you know, what I'm saying what the dap is. So he was very serious when it came to all these things. It was like either you're going to get it right or you're not going to be a part of it at all. 
And then one of the co-workers talked about how one time he was hanging with Robert Townsend, Janet Jackson, Sid Bad, and, you know, Adina Howard. He drinking some whiskey in the back. So he said he poked his head back there and they was like, who ordered white rice? He said, and they all laughed. He said, and I just didn't get it. I didn't know what was going on. He was a white man. Okay. Then we got Brian McKnight talking and he's saying it was Arsenio Hall, Eddie Murphy, Kadeem Hardison. He said Harrison Ford, we would hang out. The parties was insane. They was crazy. You know, Sam bad saying how happy he was to be a part of this to have a brother at the helm they would have a good time they were so proud of him they couldn't believe he had even had that daggone office you know everyone would just go up there and hang out and he said shoot we plotted to overthrow hollywood you couldn't tell us nothing right and brian mcknight talks about how one day he asked him like so who you been listening to lately as far as music was? And he told him Tevin Campbell. He said, okay, well, Tevin Campbell it is. He done brought Tevin Campbell in for him to be a part of the project and be on the soundtrack, right? And Tevin Campbell really was on a goofy movie soundtrack, okay? If you know, you know. I think it was supposed to be Bobby Brown originally, and then Tevin Campbell ended up being the final choice. And so that part was true. And so they was just talking about all these, you know, great things that he did. But of course, you know, we had to start taking a turn when things started going bad. He started having problems in his relationship, having more arguments. He was so you just engrossed into this movie. Um, you know, they have been having problems for a while now, but then it escalated. And one time when she was really into this nasty argument with him, he was saying things that he never said, doing things he never did. And. You know, one of these arguments, Maxwell tried to step in and he actually raised his hand and she was like, that was it. OK. And she had told him, like, you're going to lose your son. You're going to end up losing him or whatever. Right. And then Mr. In-Between lets us know later in his part of the interview that the wife actually left him. And he was like, you know, that really did break his heart. And she was there with him from the beginning. So this was something that was literally destroying his private life. Now, you know, Brian McKnight talks about how they didn't realize how bad it was or what it was. Nobody really had a name for mental illness or paid attention to mental illness the way they did do now right they knew that it was something wrong but they really couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was it even got to a point where he was paranoid and felt like people was after him and brought in security you know he would be introducing them to security but if he said well if they said well who's after you he couldn't tell them exactly who it was or he didn't tell them exactly who it was right and so his son was just saying that it all went downhill from there and you know of course this made him sad and it just Change so much stuff for him and at this point he was sleeping in his office and one day they had a board meeting and they like you know are you on top of this are you taking care of it because they said the budget for goofy is getting crazy is a bit high and he basically told them like you know of course i am right of course i got this because they said are you do you got the budget under control but he started laughing they said talking about i'm goofy and was doing the goofy laugh you know the guy sitting there demonstrating and he said it was a chilling laugh it was a goofy laugh but it was crazy okay and broken i can't demonstrate it the way he did but baby i said what you know so he I, like really thought he was turning into goofy and at this point it was getting terrifying and you know he had almost started crying because he said he really did think he was goofy so now at this point you know they want him out they want him out okay they are trying to say like the company knew he had to go but legally he was still the ceo so they wanted to work something out with him where he's not there on site okay and they still would give him something. Now the cousin says it was seventy five thousand, but they say no, it was seventy five million, and he was supposed to get it over a ten year period. But either way, he turned down both. Okay, he didn't want no parts of them. I said what? Yeah. So anyway, you know, at this point, they have him come in to see the final cut because. He had something that was completely a mind child and they wasn't supposed to, you know, they didn't want to go with him. OK, when it came to this ending, they wanted he wanted it where Goofy was going to get shot. Child. Goofy was going to have the cops pull up on him and get shot. I said, what? And then when they showed the sketch, it was a pig standing by the car. I said, no, y'all didn't. OK. Another thing he wanted was Goofy to get electrocuted when he went on stage because he said ain't no way in the world you just running up on stage at a big venue and nothing ain't happening to you. That's unrealistic. OK, he also wanted Huey Newton sitting on his daggone throne 
and he wanted a scene with a thrift you know store so they had pulled all of that out and put this bigfoot in and he was pissed the hell off he was like y'all done took my stuff and messed it all up this is unrealistic you know what i'm saying this is not the way that i wanted it you know y'all on some bull job when they asked him do he think that his cousin's death was an accident he said no comment but when they asked one of the co-workers the co-workers was like no i do not they said why you don't they said one because of his mood and two because of the tape they said what tape so then we get this tape where thomas is breaking down he's saying i'm so close you know um i did all of this for you i did all of this for us i meant the best when you finally see it you're gonna see everything i was working on and everything that i was trying to do i never meant for it to be this way i don't know how it got this way you know i gotta finish this i gotta do what i need to do to make this work and to make you know this come out the right way that it's supposed to be he up here crying and everything so I was like, oh, man, you know, and in the mix of all of this in between, you know, this tape and him coming in and seeing what they final thing was that they did. The guy says that he tried to go and look for him because he basically had ran out once he seen what they did. And they said he was gone, you know, and then Mr. Inbetween said, all we know is that he got in that car and he took off and nobody didn't never see him. He just didn't come back. Right. And so as we move on, you know, we find out that basically, you know, January 14th, 1995, investigators found Thomas's Impella, okay, Impala at the bottom of the Catholic Lake, 40 miles from Burbank, California, right where him and his son used to go fishing, but nobody was never found. So why they cut to, you know how when something happens, they have the crime scene and they take the pictures. Child, why they had the goofy um glove and shoe there? I said, you know what? I'm done with y'all. Y'all be doing too much, okay? Y'all be doing entirely too dad on much. But, you know, bottom line, as we start ending out this episode... You know, the son and his wife both are just saying that it was hard for them, right? And the wife was saying that she went from one point to never wanting to see none of his movies or watch them because it hurt so bad to her watching it all the time because it would make her feel like she still had a piece of him there or whatever, right? And being proud of him and really looking, saying, wow, he really did what he set out to do without him even knowing it. And if he would have still been around, he would be really proud of the outcome of it, too. At the end of the day, um, it did become something that she could watch in a fun way and feel like she still had a piece of him there. And it did show that he really did bring the culture together and do what he wanted to do for the culture. He did bring the family together. And the son talked about that meme that says, damn, bitch, you live like this, and that they be sharing all over Twitter and Facebook and everywhere. And he says his dad made that while he was in college. So for that to still be around, you know, this long after um, everything and have people sharing it, that shows a lot, you know. And he basically was saying, you know, the love is real and the family is real. These are drawings he did in college and black folks are living their lives being funny and, you know, know being free and being real and sharing this and so that is something that made him feel good and was able to put a smile on his face and you know his mom was just basically saying that he really would have been proud that he did become a part of the culture he did become you know that's all he wanted at the end he did become a family and when it's all said and done he did make the blackest movie okay of all time and that was how the episode ended y'all i was okay with this this was cute with me you know it's an in memory of thomas ronald washington y'all you know and just really quickly shout out to floyd norman floyd norman actually was the first um disney african-american animator you know um he worked with the company and did some of the most historic movies of all time you know everything from um history films to high school films to sleeping beauty to the dalmatians to jungle book to mulan you know he did Hanna barbera scooby-doo pixar of course toy story and monsters inc and all of that kind of stuff so some of our biggest classics came from him shout out to him if it was anything that I forgot to discuss or that you guys want to discuss, put it in the comments. Please let me know. Let me know what you thought about this episode. Let me know if you knew about these different facts 
um, pertaining to Disney and some of the things that they went through. If you know about the spook that sat by the door, let's discuss it all, y'all. Put it in the comments. Like, comment, share, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe if you were so inclined. Give me a wave. Let me know you came by. Put some flames up in the sky. All right, y'all. Till next time. Tulu.